What is a costume? Exactly. Is it something little children wear on, on Halloween? Is it something someone's mother volunteers to make from a Big Four pattern for the school play? Is it an exacting and meticulous recreation of a historical extant garment held in a museum collection? Are period films all supposed to be exact documentaries portraying the time, or are they supposed to be art? Well, I'm here today to not answer those questions. Because my chief concern with, yes, even historical costumes, is this. Is it pretty? That's right. I'll tell you what, kids. That's my number one. Is it pretty? Like, is this dress completely one hundo accurato? No. I don't care. Can you see it? It's stunning. I think all vintage and historic costuming enthusiasts, lovers of historic dress, have a certain mm, BS meter shall we say, for media in general, for television and film, theater even, things that just take us out of the moment that, uh, you know, when something is so inaccurate, so out of time, so out of place, so anachronistic, that we just get pulled out of the film entirely and cannot continue, kind of have a blue screen of death moment, you know. But something I think we fail to realize quite often here, as such enthusiasts, is that most people don't know anything about historic dress. And now some people will say, now, this is the more the reason than ever that every single film and television adaptation of anything that happens in the past ever should be completely and utterly accurate in order to educate the public at large. But, like, the public at large don't care about the fine detail of almost literally anything. So my personal BS meter for this kind of thing is pretty chill. It's... It's pretty relaxed. I have a degree in apparel design. I took historic fashion classes as part of my, like, university degree. Not that that makes me any more qualified than any other enthusiast, because I can assure you that I learned more about historic costume researching on the internet and from books, from libraries and stuff like that than I did in those classes, but I digress. But my personal BS meter for this kind of thing, again, is pretty relaxed. It takes a lot to get me quite upset to pull me out of the moment. For example, I loved the recent Little Woman adaptation. Come at me, you know. Uh, I thought that Amy's apron, that one scene where she's wearing that cute apron or her little artsy painting dress, I love that outfit and I would love to have that apron, okay? Did the fit of this dress physically cause me some pain? Yes. Yes, okay? I admit it. Did I also see this film multiple times in theaters because I too want a book deal more than a husband? Also, yes. Did I love this bow and this hat and Agent Carter? No. No, I didn't. I really... No one really bothered me, actually. I wrote a whole blog post about it, but then I got an email in my inbox responding to that blog post. Yes, I had complained about this bow in season two of Agent Carter because as someone who collects 1940s hats, w why? You know, why? Just why? Yes, that's right, I complained about this bow on my tiny insignificant blog, and yet somehow it made it back to the someone who worked on the costumes on the show, and they sent me an email defending their choices that I had, you know, torn apart in said blog post. And, and then I realized a real person had decided on that bow and that they maybe didn't deserve me tearing them a new one, you know, for a hat that maybe they had to put together the night before. Who knows what happened with the script changes, the producers, the budget, etc., etc. I'm not there in that, you know, decision-making situation, but they, they were. And uh, I felt a little bit bad, you know, that I had torn someone's hard work apart and they felt the need even to defend themselves to some random blogger in the Midwest who you know, only knows so much about anything. Which does bring me to a bit of a point here, which is that perhaps because of this small interaction that I've had with a semi-famous uh, costume designer for television who I would, in all honesty, love to work for, but had, you know, clearly have thrown the bathwater out with that one a while ago, thanks to being negative on the internet, um, I won't be doing that today. No, I won't be tearing apart anybody else's hard work that ended up in film and television. No, today I'm going to be tearing apart someone who really deserves it. Me. That's right. Me. We're gonna be, we're gonna be roasting my costumes today. That's the whole idea. Get it? You get it. You get it. That's right, today I'm going to be roasting my own attempts at historical costuming from years past, and we're gonna talk a little bit about my history with costuming in general today as we go through and look at all the things I got wrong. Beginning at the start with this 18th century dress. Now, we're not allowed to roast this dress because my lovely mom made it for me when I was 16 from one of the big four patterns of it at the time. I had just fallen in love with the film Marie Antoinette. I was a tiny baby child. I'm actually in these pictures. It's my 16th birthday. I had a Marie Antoinette themed 16th birthday party. Cue privileged white girl jokes in here somewhere. They're, it's rife with them, honestly. My super sweet 16, the Versailles edition with it 
Costco sheet cake, you know. I was in theater, all my friends were theater kids, everyone dressed up. It wasn't a big ask to ask people to dress up for a party. People were into it. So yes, this was my 16th birthday dress. I had no idea what stays were yet, and certainly the big four pattern companies and my mom didn't know what stays were yet either. So that's right, I didn't actually make this dress. My wonderful mom made this dress for me, and I was incredibly thankful and felt like a princess at the time. And after half a decade more of research and learning and getting a degree in apparel design and all that jazz, I decided to go ahead and try and remake and rework this costume a little bit to make it a little bit more historically accurate, even though at that point it, it didn't hardly fit anymore because age 16, age 21, you know, it's just not the same size of human any longer. But I decided to go ahead and try and take this costume and rework it into something a little bit more historically accurate. So let's see how I did. I have my digital photo viewing device here in hand so I can look at these with you. But here I am again on the right here, age 16, and my hair is actually quite impressive, even though you can definitely tell this is a curling iron, no? But as you can see, Simplicity or Butterick or whoever this was didn't exactly have all the details correct on this 18th century pattern. I mean, the bows down the front are really selling it for us, worn of course over no stays, as I've said, and again, the polyester home decor fabric really selling it. So what did I do to try and transform this dress into something a little more historically accurate in 2013? Well, here we can see me in terrible lighting in a photo that looks like it was taken through a potato, honestly. Um, but I have, of course, cut the front of the dress away so that it is now worn over stays, or cut to wear over stays, and worn with a front stomacher and pinned in place down the front. So we have that going for us. Many gowns were made this way so that they would pin along the stomacher to the stays in front. Um, not all garments in the historical past actually had hook and eyes or fasteners. Sometimes they were just attached with pins. We can see here that I've completely changed the way this gown is trimmed and constructed, really. Um, I did go ahead and just cut the bodice off of the skirt, and I think I had a little bit of fabric left over from when this project had originally been made, and I cut a completely new bodice out of that. But I think I did have to reuse the sleeves. So these sleeves I still think are the big four pattern, but I have added some additional ruffling going on on top of that polyester lace at my uh, sleeves. For the stomacher for this piece, I did make a separate like stomacher piece to pin onto my stays for this. Um, I have some pictures um, from my blog post when I was talking about doing this, and I made pinked and ruffled trimming to put on the stomacher, and then I also hand knotted some fly fringe to the best of my ability. Who knows how accurate this fly fringe is, but it's more accurate to have fly fringe at least. So I made some of that and put it on the stomacher and to the front trimmings of this gown as well. One of the biggest problems of this, other than the fact that this is 100% polyester, is how short the outer gown is. Um, the petticoat is longer because I had remade a new petticoat to wear with this, so it was a more appropriate length. However, the gown itself is still just too short, you know. Obviously it was made for 16 year old me. I may have been a few inches shorter back then. I haven't grown in a long time, so who really knows? But um, the gown itself is just too short, honestly. But there's really no saving something like this when it's made, again, out of 100% polyester decorator fabric. There's no real way to make that look hella accurate, let's just be honest. But I do think you can see how much I learned about what an actual 18th century garment the silhouette is supposed to look like, and I'm making strides, making some improvements here, so I can at least train my eye to see the difference between something inaccurate and accurate. So what comes next in my historic costuming timeline here after refurbing that one particular gown? Well, I have this attempt at a swallowtail jacket, the one that is in the Williamsburg collection. I'll put a picture of the Williamsburg jacket here. This has been dubbed the swallowtail jacket. It has these cute little tails in the back that you will see in my version actually as well. Here, I'll actually show you the back first. So here I am in my cotton version of a little 18th century jacket here, quilting cotton again from Joann's. Now, I actually still quite like this jacket. I think it's pretty cute, no? I mean, this is a great little Halloween costume. I think I wore this with some piratey accessories as a pirate costume once even, perhaps if I'm remembering co correctly. But I still think this is a very cute costume, honestly. It's not hyper accurate. Uh, the jacket isn't bad, really. I have a front lacing situation going on here over a stomacher again, however, which isn't too terribly inaccurate. I think that's how this actual jacket closed is front lacing, which seems like something that would be very inaccurate, but actually was done depending on the period, depending on the garment. But of course, not with polyester, 99 cents a roll, ribbon. So a cotton cord or an actual silk ribbon would have done wonders here. And the thing about this, uh, although it is fitting over my stays and, and pretty okay, honestly, uh, I didn't have a way to set my shoulders correctly with this pattern. So the way that 18th century shoulders on a gown are set normally, uh, sometimes you, you need a 
a friend to help you. It's not really easy to do all on your own. And I certainly wasn't practiced at it when I was making this costume. So it's not really set properly in the back. The sleeves don't have the best fit. They're not sitting on the shoulder exactly as they should. And wrinkles are appearing on the garment because of this fit issue. But again, at least I am wearing this over stays and have some concept of what the correct silhouette is supposed to look like here. This petticoat is a simple, like sheer cotton pleated over a, again, probably cotton broadcloth poly cotton blend broadcloth, again, from the quilting sex section at Joann's. I remember I got this sheer striped cotton at my favorite local fabric store um, for like $3 a yard or something like that. Again, cost was a major factor in my early costuming attempts. I've also added a sheer cotton like kerchief fichu to this costume. I think that's how it's said in French. Lord knows my French is not at proficient. Um, but I, and I also have a bergère, again, more French words, hat, a like low shallow crowned wide flat hat on. So again, that's more of an accurate look. So really this costume actually isn't that bad. Weirdly enough, I like was doing okay. I was like getting better and then we'll find a disaster in a minute here and then hopefully we can get better again from there. And from stepping into a more accurate direction, we step instead next into a more costumey, like directly intentionally costumey direction with this next ensemble here. Here I have a polyester moire and sequined 18th century jacket, which for some reason using the same pattern with this polyester moire is just not fitting the same here. Um, it looks almost okay from the side here. You can see how the back lacing is buckling a little bit, even in this picture, but you know, that polyester bangaline or bangalin, whatever, however it's pronounced, ribbed moire fabric is just not molding to the body as nicely as say something in silk would. But what happened here was that I had spent some time while I was studying abroad, learning to do tambour embroidery at the Royal School of Needlework, which by the way, if you are in England, I highly recommend taking uh, embroidery classes at the Royal School of Needlework. It was a really fun day. But seeing as I had learned tambour embroidery, I wanted to make a wildly embellished sort of stomacher. And of course I really wanted a zone front gown, which is kind of what the style tends to be called, where it has the, I don't know, triangle of embellishment going the opposite direction sort of on the front of the gown. I only had a little bit of this polyester moire, so I couldn't make a whole gown. A moire is actually a very accurate textile choice for this time period, which I would say is probably like, I'm vaguely referencing sort of like 1770s, 70, 1780s here um, is kind of what I'm trying to shoot for. Again, very vaguely, this is a total fantasy costume. Everything is polyester and I know that I'm not going to be again. I knew at the time I wouldn't be, be able to achieve an historical look with polyester. Um, and this skirt is completely fantastic and more Elsa-like than anything, honestly. It's just a uh, polyester satin skirt with a uh, poly sequined um, and glitter <laughs> polyester like Christmas fabric from Joann's overskirt to it. So the skirt is completely a fantasy thing. Um, and so is the jacket really. I mean, short jackets were a thing, but not nearly as much as they were in my costuming if you were to go by percentages wise. So I wasn't, and I'm not particularly happy or proud of this costume, happy with it. I had a lot of, you know, grand ideas and not a way to execute them really. So as much time as I spent meticulously doing the tambour embroidery for the zone front on this little jacket. I mean, there was just never any hope that this was going to come out like it had, like I had it in my head, really. I would say my favorite part of this costume is actually the wreath I'm wearing on my head, which was fun to make and, you know, sheds glitter everywhere, but made me feel like a forest winter fairy. And that's always nice. So I think my favorite part is probably the wreath and not any of the clothes. Although again, this cloak here was made by my mom back again in my Lord of the Rings phase when I was about 12. So thanks mom for the cloak. Sticking with the polyester for our next costume here, we're jumping to a completely different time period. And uh, actually, I think I did a lot better with this one accuracy wise, other than again, the polyester situation. But I actually made this Edwardian gown in 2014 for a Your Wardrobe Unlocked competition. For those of you unfamiliar with Your Wardrobe Unlocked, it was another um, website run by Kathy Hay and her team, I suppose, that I think got rolled into Foundations Revealed. At one time, there was Foundations revealed for corsetry and undergarments and your wardrobe unlocked for like outerwear and like costumes. Um, but I think they've been rolled together since then. I haven't been keeping up very well in the past half a decade or so. But back then, man, was I obsessed. I was a member to both your wardrobe unlocked and foundations revealed at this time back in 2014 when I made this gown and entered it into the competition. I had just read the night circus, I believe. And of course, everyone wants this worth gown. You know, the one, the worth ironwork gown. And so I was going to try and make a version of the Worth Ironwork gown, which other people have done to great success. But uh, I found this Art Nouveau-ish flocked polyester taffeta on the internet in the UK somewhere. And I had 10 yards of it or something shipped over. And of course, 10 yards of polyester taffeta 
is a lot cheaper than 10 yards of silk taffeta would be. And uh, I didn't have to do any applique work or anything like that because the print was already inherent on the fabric. Before I could make this gown, I had to make an Edwardian corset, which came out kind of like this. And for that, it's perfectly fine and accurate and serviceable because it's from a truly Victorian pattern. So I didn't make the pattern for the corset myself, which is why it came out quite well. But I did make the pattern for the like gown, the bodice and skirt for this costume myself from using references that I found online and then also in Patterns of Fashion from Janet Arnold. So this costume was made with every intention of being quite historically accurate, despite the fact that the whole thing was made out of poly once again. Not that I could have found a flocked silk taffeta anyway, because I don't think I've seen many of those for sale anywhere. And if they were, I think they'd probably be four or $500 a yard, specialty woven in, you know, Italy or things like that. So they're really the only way to do this without you know, having a fabric custom woven is to do it applique style, and some people have, and they've done marvelous work with it. But this was my version of the ironwork gown. I actually think it's quite successful. Again, I'm not sure I like sleeveless things on me. For any of you wondering if I've got any insecurities laying around, the answer is yes, and it's the upper half of my arms. But, you know, we, we all can't be perfect creatures. And so I would like to have a sleeve on this, even for accuracy sake, it would probably make more sense to have a sleeve on this. Although there were sleeveless evening gowns in this sort of turn of the century period that I'm going for here. I actually really enjoyed and found this costume really rewarding and fun to make. Um, of course, I, nothing came of the competition because I was a beginner, if that. I think I could improve upon my silhouette a little bit here as well with a larger, like, some more hip padding to make my waist look smaller, just because I don't know how much more I can reduce my waist. This corset doesn't re it doesn't change the shape of me too, too terribly. I think I could probably get a little bit more out of corsetry and a little bit more out of padding if I really wanted to have that very Gibson girl silhouette in the future, um, especially with hip padding. I can, you know, you can only take so much away, but you can always add more. So I think I could do a little bit more silhouette ma manipulation where I to do Edwardian things again. But in general, again, I can't roast this too hard because I actually do still quite like it. Although we can talk about my hair, which... I think it was in a bob at this point already, so you really, you can't make Gibson girl hair out of a bob very easily, so I guess I'll give myself a pass, but could have bought a wig, you know, could have bought a wig. Any of you who have seen my Haunted Mansion sort of themed lookbook from last October have seen this dress before. I wore it in the end of that lookbook. It does still fit. Thankfully, uh, I don't have many balls or night circus adventures to wear it to. Um, I've never actually worn it out of my house, but maybe one day. Now, next up, we have a costume from 2015 that... I dislike so much that it was the one that made me have the idea to do this video. So there's that. Now from the back, I don't think this pet, pet on air, I don't know again how to say the French, pet on air, looks that bad from the, from the back here. We can almost, we can pretend that the skirt was taffeta maybe, but it's cotton muslin uh, because I ran out of funds to make a skirt to match this. The uh, little jacket here, the cropped jacket, which again, was looks okay from behind, is actually a tissue taffeta that I bought. Uh, it's actual real silk. That's right. Finally, we have some real silk in my costuming, you know. And the reason I was able to do that is because this is a absolutely super, super ultra thin taffeta from a discount fabric store that I found on the sale table in the back. And I was able to get a couple of lengths of, not enough to make a skirt, but enough that I made this costume and then had a bunch laying around that I line things with all the time that you've seen me do. But I digress. This is a very, very thin silk, which of course didn't help when it came time to construct things that were supposed to fit tightly around stays. So we'll see some serious fit issues with this guy. So the back, the back looks okay. I was inspired by this Petonair skirt set situation that I think was sold by Christie's that I had seen online. So I was inspired by that garment to make this one and try and make it work. I knew I only had enough silk for half a dress basically. So I was trying to make it work, but here's the image we can see where everything has gone, it's really gone wrong. You know, um, we can see all of the fit problems with my shoulder situation and the top of the sleeve on this, this pattern. Um, again, this is the same, you know, drafted from the same sort of pattern I was using earlier for that cotton jacket, but in this super thin silk, it really is not holding up and it's showing every problem thanks to the two-toned like quality of the silk. It really shows every fold and pull. Clearly I've tried to cover some of my sins here with extra ruffles and trimmings, but it's really not working. The gown itself needs to have some more room in the front. I think it's just, I cut it too small and therefore the stomacher is very wide and an odd shape really. I just don't think it's working, <laughs> honestly. And it's not very flattering on me either. Not that that usually is something of chief concern of mine, but ew. but this is just not my best look. And uh, you know, again, the muslin petticoat here, 
It's pleated in a similar fashion to how 18th century petticoats are pleated. I do believe I have it like pleated in the back and the front with ties that tie in the back and the front. You know how 18th century petticoats are made, right? You know what I mean? It's done that way. However, it is again, just cotton muslin. And honestly, it's weirdly enough too long really here. Um, I probably made this as a petticoat intending to then eventually make a skirt to go over it. But of course the funds for silk never magically arrive. So here it is just with muslin and ay ay ay, the fit on this, I, it's just crazy. And I don't think they have, I don't think this color was possible in the 18th century. Um, it would have, you know, it could have been made from blue and like pink or blue and red threads being cross woven. That's how iridescent fabrics are like this are woven, but I'm just not sure this vivid of a situation was possible with natural dyes at the time. Of course, aniline and other chemical dyes invented in the like 1850s and 60s made colors like this more achievable, but before then, not exactly an achievable thing. But again, you know, I don't, I don't mind an anachronistic color, but this thin, thin silk was just not up to the task that I tried to set it. And this hedgehog wig on me is an interesting choice. I actually bought this huge 18th century wig on Hollywood Boulevard one time when I was living in LA, my freshman year of college, I bought this huge, like uh, the Duchess hedgehog style wig. And I still have it somewhere. Maybe I can restyle that wig and make it work sometime. But I'm not, again, sure it's the best silhouette of hair with my face shape. And with the makeup I have going on here, it's again, not the best look. But you know what I do like about this costume? The only thing I like about this costume really is the hat actually. I just really love this huge hat. I made this one uh, like a Gainsborough style or portrait style hat is what these were called. You can see them in portraits from the 18th century. Um, they were a thing. And this one is inspired by the film, The Duchess, where they were inspired by that style of hat. But of course this is a, uh, you know, your, your cheap costumey version because this is a hat blank from like Michael's or something that was back in the like basket section, I wanna say of the craft store somewhere. The ribbon around the edge of this is a polyester satin ribbon that I think is hot glued on, not sewn, which is not ideal. Whenever going for a very historic look, hot glue is not the answer usually. Um, the feathers are actually kind of nice. They're an okay quality feather. They have a lot of poofiness to them. Um, I must have ordered them online as opposed to getting them at the craft store because you can't usually get really poofy ostrich feathers that are more accurate usually at the craft store, they don't have them. So I must've ordered the feathers online, but you know, it's halfway there. I do like this hat. I think, you know, if I bought a nicer ribbon and re like sewed it over this one, I think this hat would be serviceable for the future. The quality of the straw, of course, is not there and would be laughable to someone in the 18th century, I suppose. But you know, I do like the hat. The rest, bin it, honestly, just, just bin it. Now this next 18th century gown Finally, I'm able to make a gown, you know, a full length situation. Do I have enough fabric to make a matching petticoat? No, that's still not happening. But again, doing this in cotton meant that I had the funds to go ahead and buy enough fabric to make it at least an entire gown. And this is a pleated back anglaise style dress. However, I didn't really exactly know what I was doing. And I think I messed up the way the skirt gets attached to the bodice on the sides. Like I pleated the back and the center back situation fine, I think. That was that was okay. But then the sides of the skirt and like pleating the rest of the skirt up into the bodice, I think I said it wrong. I think you can see in this picture here, it's just has this large sort of pleat where there's no fabric where it's like smooth and something has gone wrong here. But I mean, again, I was making an attempt to be more historical instead of cutting the piece back in four pieces, which actually was done as well. Um, I was trying to do that thing where you pleat the back into the skirt all in one piece. I was making an attempt. Um, again, I'm wearing this with that black cheap cotton petticoat from my other costume before. So that's an ideal. Again, I don't know if orange and black would have been paired necessarily like this, especially in a casual cotton like this. This is actually a patterned like block printed cotton that I ordered from India. So that's actually quite accurate uh, in a colonialist way. You know, I ordered the printed fabric straight from India, just like they would have in the 18th century, um, much cheaper online. And I got to browse at my leisure, which I'm sure was a little different in the 18th century, but you know, something about the skirt on this just isn't sitting properly, but I do quite like the bodice. Again, for some reason, this bodice pattern just works better in a cotton, even if the shoulder and sleeve cap area is still leaves a lot to be desired. At least like the bottom of the sleeve, I feel like is working out pretty well. This is actually a two piece sleeve. It has a top and a bottom pattern piece. And then the little tiny box pleated trim on the neckline and the sleeve of this, I also like as well. And again, it is just kind of like a very Halloween looking costume. So I do appreciate that, but the skirt just isn't ideal. 
Uh, probably would have been better flat lined somehow. This is a very, very thin cotton as well. I do actually still have a little bit of this fabric left over. I had originally bought this fabric hoping to make a bustle gown out of it actually, but then I just decided I couldn't use a lightweight cotton to make a bustle gown in good faith really for the style that I wanted to do. I knew what I needed, what I really wanted was silk, but so I ended up viewing this and I think it actually is a little bit more accurate than that bustle gown would have been. And in this one, this is actually all my own hair in trying to make a hedgehog style out of it. So that was fun. Um, very small curls in my hair here. I don't know. I haven't, I've been growing my hair out a little bit, but you can tell because my hair has like some weird color things going on here that my hair is colored, which of course is not very accurate. But overall, this costume I think suffers the most from that shoulder and uh, sleeve cap fit issue. And then also the skirt not fitting onto the bodice correctly. Clearly I went wrong somewhere there. Needed to do a little bit more research to get that right. So the skirt just doesn't sit properly, which kind of ruins the whole shebang here. I think I'm kind of going for like a 1780s situation here, but the skirt silhouette requires something that I don't have. <laughs> something going on here that I didn't, I didn't do. I don't know if I'm wearing just like bum rolls, or like bum pads underneath this and petticoats, or if I have my panniers on with this, which my panniers are again from that costume when I was 16. So they're like a cheap simplicity pattern with some plastic boning. They're not really ideal, but I don't even know what I'm wearing for skirt supports under this. And if I can't tell, then it's not enough. And lastly, before I sort of threw in the towel on the whole venture of historic costuming myself entirely, we have here my late Victorian set of undergarments. This is a little late Victorian chemise, very like low cut for evening gowns chemise with a black silk Victorian corset that I made um, based off of a pattern in Corsets and Crinolines, I believe, which is a book I do not own, but someone had scanned, I think, the two pages I needed. So I just printed them out and modified this corset pattern to fit me. And I actually quite like the way this fits still now. Uh, I've, had, I've tried this corset on since, and I'm sad because I have thrown away the pattern. Don't know why past me didn't save this one. But anyway, here's my black silk corset um, based off of an 1880s example and a chemise uh, that's very thin cotton, probably could make a more robust chemise, honestly. But uh, then lastly, of course, the cage lobster bustle here, which again was made from a truly Victorian pattern and therefore was hard to mess up because they, they make great patterns and they're very easy to follow. So this little lobster, paisley lobster tail bustle situation, which is one of the funniest garment things anyone, I mean, I, I mean, even the cage crinoline is silly, but like, it's not nearly as silly as this is. These are just the silliest garments. I love it. Um, I never even attached the hook or closure on the front of this bustle because I pretty much stopped costuming after I put together this set of undergarments because I was really trying my best to figure out a way I could make a bustle dress in cotton and have it feel as luxurious and accurate as I wanted it to be. Um, most of the time, cotton bustle dresses, it seems like the one at least ones at least in extant collections are either like a cotton brocade and like a very intense fabric, um, like something that's like a cotton velvet with multiple levels of texture to it. Either that or the cotton dresses seem to be light, airy, white, tissot, kind of like flowy confection things. And I really wanted like a traveling dress, so kind of like something almost in wool or silk, but I could not afford eight to 10 yards of wool or silk. So if you go back on my blog and you go to this ton of time period in the end of 2015, it's a lot of me like talking about trying to faff around, figuring out a design to make a bustle dress without having to buy wool or silk because I couldn't afford it. So those were my main attempts in the past of historic costuming. And I think, you know, an overall grade here, we can just give me like a, like a three out of 10, honestly, for both accuracy and I don't know, design and execution, all that kind of thing. Really, it was a lot of aiming pretty high and not being able to hit it in any of the main ways, materials, fit, you know, patterning, anything like that, construction. Um, almost, if not all of this was done with machine sewn, not hand sewn, which is of course, you know, a contentious thing in the costuming environment, whether or not something is sewn by a machine or done accurately by hand, which I mean is great. Both are great. I think both have their pluses and their minuses. Um, I like things to be made fast. So that's why I like sewing by machine and why I like making retro projects so much because I can make a 1950s dress in one day and I like that kind of quick turnaround. But the main reason I stopped making historical costumes was because of this disconnect between the things I wanted to be making and the things I was able to afford to make. It really was more of a budgetary problem. Um, the things I wanted most, the things I was most passionate about making and trying to create silk bustle gowns, silk robe à la française, you know, things I just could not afford to make unless I made them in polyester. And 
having to concede to a lesser fabric like that that you know is inaccurate makes you want to take other shortcuts. At least for me, it does. Um, I'm sure there's some people out there who make meticulous hand-sewn polyester 18th century dresses, and I'm sure they come out quite beautiful if you are invested in it. But like for me, having to concede on the fabric like that really, I like lose half of my steam just in that concession. Really, I feel like, uh, why bother? doing anything like nicely or finishing thing nicely when it's just always going to be a polyester nightmare anyway. And around this same time back in 2015 or so, I had kind of had, I had to break up with historic costuming. What had happened was I sort of decided that I would like to go into historic costuming or rather historic preservation of historic extant garments professionally. I really would decided like I would love to work in collections as a collections manager perhaps, but I had a degree in apparel design not in history or not in preservation or conservation or anything like that. And so no one would consider me for an actual job in museums because I did not have a, you know, master's or PhD. I only had my undergraduate degree in fashion design, which of course, as everyone knows, literally is a worthless piece of paper, honestly. Don't do it. We'll, we'll get into it some day, but don't do it. But with my flimsy little bachelor's degree in fashion design, no one would consider me for museum work. Uh, I tried applying to a couple of part-time entry-level positions, um, you know, with a passionate cover letter and work experience, having worked in museums before, having interned in museums before, and no one would even interview me without a master's or a, you know, PhD in this kind of thing. And I really got demoralized and really felt like I needed to almost take a break from historic costuming even privately, even as a hobby, because I couldn't afford enough silk to make a proper gown, let alone a master's degree to be able to go and then go ahead and work with actual gowns. And it all kind of just piled on and I kind of had to just divorce myself from historic costume altogether and take a breather. Which leads me up to here and now in 2020, where, as you know, I spend most of my time making retro and vintage inspired garments here in my sewing room, and I haven't made any historic dress of any kind, any done any stay making, corset making, historic costuming for several years. But that doesn't mean I ever fell out of love with historic costuming. It's kind of my roots. It's my start. It's where I got my start in sewing. It's why I learned to sew in the first place was to have 18th century gowns. I still don't have one. Honestly, I just never really thought I would be able to afford enough silk to make a real bustle gown, to make a real 18th century gown. Um, it was just something that I just felt like I'm never going to be able to get enough money saved aside, set aside to do something like that, especially when costuming is something that is such a frivolous hobby, hobby for me. I don't have anywhere to wear them. I don't have anything to do with them. There's no events really going on here in the middle of nowhere. So it really would be only for my own enjoyment. And it seemed like such a huge investment and a uh, huge you know, expense for something that would only ever be to just for my own joy, really. But thanks to the support I've received here on the channel and over on Patreon, I have been able to set aside a bit of a costuming fund this year, which means for the first time in a long time, I'm going to be diving into doing some historic costuming and I'll be doing it here on the channel for all of you. So I'll be making my dream decadent gothic Victorian bustle gown and I hope you all come along for the ride. Thank you for making this possible by watching my channel, by supporting my channel, by support supporting me on Patreon as well. Um, depending on, you know, how this goes, I may do more costuming in the future. It really just depends on if this is a disaster or not. So we'll see. Hopefully I have the, you know, wherewithal to be able to make this dress. Well, if it's a disaster, you will see that unfold as well. So hopefully everything goes well, but you'll be along for the ride in any case. So thank you for joining me on this adventure. Thank you as always for watching this video today as well. And I'll see you again real soon. Bye.